Is she good, Tina? Good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, ladies, for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, this is real estate news from the D, but today is going to be a extremely off topic, but very necessary conversation. So I am going to let the ladies introduce themselves. Um, you want to start, Tiffany? Oh, yes, I can start. Um, my name is Tiffany Perry, and I work in the area of advocacy for um, women who are victims of domestic violence. I have been doing that for five, going on six years. Um, I have seen a lot, heard a lot, and i um, ready to share information that I have to offer. Awesome. Thank you for being here. No problem. I'm sure you got a lot to share. <laughs> so, hello, Ms. Kyla. Want to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Kyla Williams. I am also what I consider to be an advocate for domestic violence slash intimate partner violence. I have actually been doing the intimate partner violence work for about 10 years, but from a law enforcement um, aspect, I have been in law enforcement 23 and a half years and like I said, doing this wow. partner violence for 10 years now. Okay. Okay. And if anybody's wondering, what does this have to do with, how is it related to um, real estate news from the D? Uh, is it because I recently started a nonprofit organization and it is um, to provide housing resources and information to women of domestic violence. The whole purpose of my nonprofit is to lift their confidence, lift their self-esteem, mm -hmm. and to give them information so that they don't feel stuck in a situation. Mm -hmm. So, which one of you ladies want to start and school us <laughs> on how we can help somebody to get out of a bad situation like domestic violence? Okay, let me start off by saying that... Um, we are going to be talking about intimate partner violence, but when we say domestic violence, those are two interchangeable terms, intimate partner violence and domestic violence. Think of it as domestic violence is the big umbrella and intimate partner violence is a component under domestic violence. Although many people use the two terms interchangeably, there is a slight difference between intimate partner violence and domestic violence. Intimate partner violence is simply that, uh, violence between intimate partners, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouses, child in common. Um, those are intimate partner violence terms. Domestic violence can be anybody that's within a household, say a parent, child, or cousins, or siblings. But for uh, our purposes here, we're going to be talking about domestic violence or intimate partner violence as a form of domestic violence. So those are the, um, the dif that's the differentiation between domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Um, we're gonna talk about what intimate partner violence is and what it is not. Intimate partner violence um, is not, it is not um, anger management, it is not um, substance abuse or alcohol abuse, things of that nature. Can those things uh, exacerbate intimate partner violence? Yes, but it is not um, intimate partner violence. Although when we respond or when we see intimate partner violence situations, alcohol, drugs, anger management, those things all play a part. Tiffany, I don't know if you wanted to add something to that before we move on. Um, mental health also plays a major part in um, intimate partner violence. Um, just something to add in there. Mm -hmm. So Tiffany, why why do you uh, believe that this is um, necessary information to put out there today? Um, well, being what I see and what I know, um, domestic violence is something that affects everyone, no matter age, race, economic status, rich, poor. It affects everyone, and it affects people in all different ways. So I really think people need to be educated 
um, just as Kyla was saying, when you say domestic violence, people just think it's just one thing. It can be psychological, it can be emotional, it can be uh, financial, it can be physical, mental. So, so it's, it's not always a black eye, right? It's Hiding not something. always a black eye. And me personally, and, you know, I really think the mental aspect is, you know, much more worse than the physical aspect not trying to downplay it but i think when someone embed things in your mind far as negative ugly you know no one wants you you're not going to never be in nothing it's hard for you to not to start to believe those things and once you start to believe those things it's like you just go down 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 you don't have no you know you get depressed you don't want to get up and put no clothes on because this man or a woman or, you know, whatever situation you're in, then embedded these things in your mind that you're ugly, no one wants you. So you start to believe those things. So it's harder to build up, you know, when you got that black eye, you're going to get your black eye and not downplaying it or minimizing it, but it's going to heal. And once it heals, it's like, you'll have the memory of it, but that physical appearance, it will be gone. But if it's mental, that's going to always remain in your mind. Mm. Yeah. Just my thoughts on it. I, I agree. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right here, Tina, I just want to talk about um, something that is prominent in the intimate partner violence field, and it's called the power and control wheel. Mm -hmm. And the power and control wheel is steadily growing, and they're they're adding, um, I guess, new spikes, if you will, to use that term. But just to briefly give um, people or your viewers an idea of what the power and control wheel is, if you think of um, a wheel and in the center of the wheel is power and control, and there are these different spikes that come out of the power and control. There's um, blaming or denying, there's use of intimidation, use of isolation. These are all um, tactics that an abuser in intimate partner violence will use against um, against the victim. They can um, intimidate them. They can isolate them from family and friends. Mm -hmm. They can um, blame them. They can uh, control the money. A lot of times an abuser in a relationship is the sole income for a household. So they control mm -hmm. the money through economic, economic abuse. Um, the power and control will is growing. If you, the original one, doesn't really include like members from the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, so now they are adding different uh, spikes, if you will, or spokes, if you will, from the uh, to the power and control wheel. So mm -hmm. we want people to know that intimate partner violence is about power and control. It's about them having the ability to control, like Tiffany said, someone's mind, mm -hmm. um, control their finances control what they do, where they go, how they think. So once a victim or a survivor decides to leave that abusive relationship, the abuser no longer has power and control over that person. So you have to be careful when you do that too, because a lot of times once you get ready to leave, your chances of lethality go up. So that's why we try to um, bring prevention and awareness about what domestic violence or intimate partner violence is what it is not, and what to do if you are in an intimate partner violence situation and what resources are available available to you. Um, there's this thing called the cycle of violence mm -hmm. where um, it starts off good, then it may transition into some type of tension mm -hmm. building, then it may transition into the actual physical violence. So you're in a relationship when you first meet someone they um, bring you flowers, candy, say I love you uh, a million times. Everything is great. It's the honeymoon phase. Then something may happen to strike something in a relationship where you feel like you're walking on eggshells around uh, the home or within the relationship. You can't say the wrong things or the person is going to uh, react or trigger in a violent way. And then mm -hmm. that's when the physical violence, the physical violence starts. And then after the physical violence starts, then you go back to that honeymoon phase again, which is, I'm sorry, I love you, more flowers, more gifts, more candy, things of that nature. I do mm -hmm. want to um, let your viewers know that not every domestic violence um, 
or intimate partner violence relationship looks this way. It may start mm -hmm. off immediately with physical abuse. You may not go to the honeymoon or the tension building stage. You might go straight to the physical abuse, but there are those uh, telltale signs there um, if you just pay attention to it. That's why it's important for advocates like Tiffany to be able to help you um, with safety planning. So mm -hmm. Tiff, I don't know if you wanna talk about safety planning at this point. Well, oh yeah, I can <laughs> So before we start with that, I got a quick question. Mm -hmm. Now, in my head, I think, you know, the, the abuse that you just described, I think that only happens with young people. For some reason, I think that, um, you know, you meet somebody and somebody abuses you. In my head, I'm thinking that's got to happen with people in their 20s because they don't know any better yet. Can you give us a picture of what age groups you're seeing and what kind of people? Is it just what I think? Is it what most of us think we see on TV? Like what? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's not <laughs> what most of us see on TV. And believe it or not, uh, we see all age groups. We see all sexual orientations. We see um, wow. teenagers. We see. Um, people in their 60s and 70s and this mm -hmm. is just, no way yeah no way. Way. And this is not just like a one-time deal this is on multiple occasions Absolutely. over and over again and a lot of times we see older people with different abusers or partners mm -hmm. in intimate partner violence relationships so it just like tiffany said there are no barriers there is no gender, no race, no sexual orientation, no economic status, um, no faith belief, any of that. It crosses all boundaries and areas. Um, and God See, forbid, in, my, in my head, I'm thinking people know better after a certain age. So we're saying that is not always the case. That Definitely is not, not. <laughs> always the case. That is not always the case. Now, again, as I stated earlier, um, a lot of it does involve alcoholism or drug oh. abuse or they're fighting over finances or, mm -hmm. and, and things of that things of that nature but there's still that aspect of the intimate partner violence and if you start digging deeper and deeper or going to group or individual counseling you will you will begin to realize that even mm -hmm. though there were there was the alcohol or the drugs present it was deeper than that mm -hmm. It was all about that power and control that, that, in, that one individual wanted to have over another individual. Wow. Okay. So I apologize, Tiffany. We were, you were about to go into um, safety you know, planning. Not on safety. <laughs> no, it's okay. No problem. We were going to go into safety planning. And um, safety planning with uh, victims is a very important aspect of domestic violence, whether you are ready to leave the relationship or not, just as mm -hmm. Kyla said, when you make that decision that you're, you know, I'm done, I'm finished, the, le the lethality does go up, meaning that's the most dangerous time in a domestic um, IPV partner relationship is when you're leaving because he feels like you're taking on the power back. So he wants to put on episodes. So that's one of the most dangerous times, but whether you are leaving or you're you know you're not ready to leave because some women are not ready to leave it's a process the average woman does go back to an abusive relationship seven times that's the average um so in the meantime if you are in a domestic situation i always say that you need someone you can trust a buddy system i always say it can be a friend um a mother or a cousin, a best friend, whoever, and you set up a safety plan with them. You may say, if I text you this cold word, black or blue or green or whatever, that means I'm in trouble and I need you to help me. Send the police or call someone, you know, that means I'm in danger. And if you're in a domestic situation, that one little thing that you set up beforehand can help you in a lot of ways because if something is happening, Nine times out of 10, the first thing they're going to do is go for your cell phone. They're going to try to cut all communication so you won't be able to call the police or call somebody. So if you set up, you know, an issue beforehand, a safety plan beforehand, 
then they don't know, you know, if you're able to just text when attention is building and you text that word or that phrase or whatever to somebody and they're able to get help for you. So before. Uh oh, what happened? I'm not sure. I think Tiffany may have had some technical difficulties, but I can continue with okay. um, the actual safety plan. And as she said, you want to have something in place to where if you are put in um, an intimate partner violence or a dangerous situation, that you have that buddy system, you have that friend you can call. Um, it could be a neighbor. You can tell a neighbor, if you see my porch light on, that means I'm, in, I'm getting my butt beat. So please call 911. Um, I've seen it where um, people who are in intimate partner violence relationships will pick up the phone and call 911 and talk to 911 dispatcher as if they were maybe ordering a pizza. Mm -hmm. And giving, I've seen that video giving, on TikTok. Giving signals, yep, giving, giving uh, on there too. And then that's an actual really true situation where you can call and you can Welcome say, back. You, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah. You were so passionate about what you were talking about. Your phone went out. I'm sorry, my phone rug and it just knocked it all out. I apologize. Okay. No problem. No problem. So That's Tiff, we were, sorry, Kyla. You want to continue? We were just talking about I had continued with the safety planning for you, um, Tiffany, saying that sometimes it could mean uh, leaving a porch light on and telling your neighbor if you see the porch light on, that means that you're in an abusive situation right now to contact 911 or you calling 911 yourself and ordering a pizza. I saw, I know that's on social mm -hmm. media right now, but that's a true, that's a true aspect of um, developing a safety plan or gathering up all your um, important documents. If you Absolutely. have children, um, birth certificates, passports, whatever it may be, and mm -hmm. taking bit by bit to that buddy or to that friend's home Absolutely. or that, that family member's home. So when it's time for you to go, then it's time for you to go. You just leave with whatever it is you have, the clothes you have on your back, and mm -hmm. you go ahead and, and you leave that particular situation. But it's important, as Tiffany said, that everybody is not ready to leave. So what we try to do is just meet um, the person who's in an a intimate partner violence uh, situation. We try to meet them where they are. If it's a safety right. plan that you need, we'll give you that safety plan. If it's group or individual counseling that you need, we have that also for you. So you can build up that strength to get to that point where you can actually leave that particular, that particular relationship. Because once you make that decision to leave, you got to be ready to leave. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, Tiff. You sound like you summed it up. I mean, like I said, it's a lot of different in intangibles because every situation is different, you know. Um, some people have family support. Some people don't have fam family support. So they may need to reach out to a group or, you know, um, an organization that helps with this type of stuff because everybody may not have a supportive family or friends that they can trust because they don't want to be judged. But, you know, I just want people to know that there are organizations and people out there who can assist you with a uh, safety plan as far as, you know, if you need shelter, um, PPO information, any type of resource you may, you may need. Um, there are limited resources, but there are resources out there that can help. And that's exactly why I'm trying to bring, you know, bring more resources. You know, I'm starting small, but I'm sure it'll grow and you know, that's the reason we're talking about it today. Absolutely, because it's definitely needed. Resources, um, shelters, you know, it's definitely needed um, out there in the world. Definitely. So, first question, are there any, like, obvious signs or telltale signs from day one that you are aware of or you could share with people of what to look for? Me, pers not personally, but me professionally, I feel like we have to go on our women's intuition. A lot of times, us as women being nurturers, we want everything to be okay. And we may have a guy and we may be in love, but he might show us a sign when we first meet him, like, why are you going over your friend house? Or why are you, you know, why are you wearing this shirt? Whereas to we may think, oh, oh that's so cute. You know, he's being, you know, uh, want to, you know, act like he controlled him, but actually that's a sign. Control, a form of control is a sign that things will only get worse. So me, I feel like control, I feel like anger 
you know, is a sign, you know, when you have a little petty argument, you know, and they get upset or, you know, may scream and holler. I feel like that's an argument to know that you can be aggressive with me because, you know, screaming and hollering, that's a sign of aggression. So I feel like in some cases there can be telltale signs, but a lot of cases they're not because men tend to mask who they are until they're comfortable and you're vulnerable and then they start pulling off the mask, exposing who they really are. You know, they can put up a front and be like, oh, okay, well, I'm this loving person. And once you get comfortable and feelings and emotions get involved, and then they feel like they got you in this box and they can keep you there. And that's when they start revealing who they really are. And then one, at that point, when you're emotionally invested in things, it's harder for you to remove yourself from that situation. Right. It's easy let, to get in and hard to get out. Exactly. <laughs> Don't let children be involved because it's really challenging too if you have children um, with someone and you're in a relationship and you're trying to get out because there are other factors that come into play when children are involved and you know children grow up and they see the violence in the home and then they grow up to be violent themselves. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because it becomes normal to them. You know, normal, you know, if you're in a house and it's chaos, it is you know, arguing and fussing and fighting, you're going to say, oh, well, this is the way you're supposed to express love because this is what I've seen growing up. And a lot of times that's when the situation becomes generational curse. You know, I've seen this, so this is what I do. Mm -hmm. Kim, um, uh-oh. So that was real valuable information, but I want to know, can we talk a little bit more about non-physical abuse? And can we also talk about if women are capable of abusing a man non-physically? Yeah, we can. Um, non-physical abuse, I think, is more damaging than the actual physical abuse. If you are abused physically, eventually you're going to heal. The black eye is going to heal. The broken arm or limb is going to mend. But non uh, physical abuse is more detrimental to me than than the physical abuse. Tiffany had given some examples of um, uh, of controlling, like controlling the finances in a home, controlling where you go, controlling what you say, what you wear. Um, there, there is an example for, say, for example, the abuser in the relationship, he is the only sole financial provider of a household. And when it's time for the money to come in, he's controlling how much money she may get. He's controlling what she may buy. He's controlling um, whatever. He's controlling what comes into the house, groceries or, or, and things of that nature. Those are all to me, non-physical signs of intimate partner violence or abuse intimate partner violence okay i got it and also you know psychological abuse is, is real as well and a lot of times when you are in an intimate partner um in a relationship you share things that you've been through and gone through with your partner and a lot of times if something comes up you know if y'all get into an argument or anything like that and they use that against you you know they use that to attack you so that's also something that you feel like well the person I put my trust in you know I told these things to this person and now they're using it against me so that's also another thing that you know people face that's non-physical um violence Mm -hmm. And look at, they, they attack your self-esteem too. Absolutely. Uh, you just attack your self-esteem too. You're ugly. Your mama don't want you. Your daddy don't want you. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be around you. Your friends don't like you. You're never going to amount to anything. You're nothing without me. I made you. I built you. I paid for this. I paid for that. Those are all signs of non-physical, physical abuse. And it tears down the self-esteem, which becomes a challenge when you're ready to leave that relationship. And that's why most women, um, or that's not, yeah, that's why most women may stay in a particular uh, violent situation. It's not the only reason why, but that's- So just not being happens. loving, just not being loving and kind could be a form of- um, Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll agree with that. Just not being mm -hmm. loving and kind could be a form of- uh, meant a non-physical intimate partner 
intimate mm. partner violence. So you know Absolutely. what? Earlier you spoke about the LGBT community, BTQ community. Can mm. we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there are um, there are little resources available for members of the LGBTQ community who have been or are in intimate partner violence relationships. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a community where a lot of people who uh, provide services and resources do not fully understand the unique needs that um, a member of the LGBTQ community may need when they're in an uh, intimate partner violence situation. One of them simply being um, shelters. Shelters are a big issue. Um, I don't recall any shelters in our local area um, that can service or that services members of the LGBTQ community. There are shelters around, but very few shelters specifically focus on the LGBTQ community. Um, okay. It's, it's just, we, we've gotten better. We've gotten better in servicing them but mm -hmm. a lot of the services and resources just in our local areas are not there. So we're constantly working with um, agencies who target this uh, LGBTQ community and can help us in providing services and resources because they are victims um, and survivors of intimate partner violence, just like those in the heterosexual community. Absolutely. I'm just curious, how often are you seeing these kinds of situations for the LGBTQ community? Um, well, we don't really see them as much as we do the um, heterosexual community where we are, but we do see them. I don't have an exact percentage, but if I had to guess, I'm thinking maybe 20, 25%. Um, is what we see we, um, from, from the law enforcement side of it. We prosecute them just like we would anyone else for the abusers on that particular um, side. The survivors in the LGBT community, they are extended the services and resources as well that we mm -hmm. have, but nothing specifically tailored towards the LGBTQ community. We are trying mm -hmm. to bridge the gap now through liaisons um, in departments, working with law enforcement, working with prosecution, working with advocates, working um, with uh, people in the courts. So we are trying to increase our services and resources for the LGBTQ community. Okay. All right. So I'm curious, one more time, <laughs> say for example, um, I guess I, my question is how many do you think uh, once a month would you see that has a serious issue and seriously needs help? Okay, when you say serious issue once a month, are you talking um, how many people um, would have an issue once a month? I'm just trying to gauge how big the demand is just because again i'm naive a lot you know in the area um, my experiences came from you know in in the 20s and younger you know with younger people so i just don't know what the numbers might look like um you know would you say five or ten people you know once a month may have these kinds of situations or is it often is it common or I'm going to say that it is common. A lot of it, a lot of intimate partner violence um, is, is done behind closed doors. Oh, yeah. um, so if they are not calling the authorities to make a report, then there are many cases that go unreported, either unreported or underreported for mm -hmm. intimate partner violence. Um, in law enforcement um, locally in the city of Detroit, the caseload for intimate partner violence is very heavy. Um, as far as repeats, we see repeat offenders. 
uh, repeat um, victims of intimate partner violence. Um, I'm just trying to think like, I, I can't, I can't give you a number, but the caseload, the caseload is heavy. Um, it's very serious. We see a lot of um, victims who um, fight back, who are fighting back their abusers, who have uh, shot and killed their abusers. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen cases escalate. It may wow. start with a simple slap today. And then next week, it may go up to some type of broken limb. And then following that, it may go up to an actual um, gunshot wound or some type of shooting or some type of weapon involved, a stabbing, things of that nature. So I would say that it's very serious. I would say that um, we see it often on a daily basis. It's just very hard to determine um, those that are unreported that go on behind closed doors where authorities are not called, are not called in to address it. Um, why, why are people, I know that it's hard once you're in a situation. I know that it's super hard to get out, but oh my goodness. Well, here's the thing. It is hard to get out of a, a relationship. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to judge those who are staying in a, an abusive relationship for whatever reason, because people stay for, for various reasons. They could stay for, because they don't have anywhere else to go. They could stay because they don't have any money. They could stay because there are young children involved and they don't have anywhere to take their children. And if we send them to a shelter, we only have one um, locally in our city. There's only one shelter um, and so the other ones are typically outside of uh, city limits and taking children there, they can't even get their kids back and forth to school if they have school aged children, or they couldn't get back and forth to work because they have a transportation, a transportation issue. So women stay for various reasons. And I think as Tiffany said earlier, women also stay because sometimes it makes them safer to stay in, in a relationship because one, they know where um, their abuser is in that particular household household with them. And two, they know that as soon as they decide to leave, their chances of lethality are going up. So that's why we have to meet them where they are and let them know when you are ready to leave or ready to move, you have to be ready to move. Wow. And so just as I stated earlier, it's normal to them. If, if they've experienced any type of um, abuse in the home growing up, growing up whether it has been them getting abused or seeing a family member getting abused it becomes normal to them and that's why we have to educate and make them aware of that that's not normal that's not what love is that's not the way you should be treated um and that's just not you know how relationships should go so that's why we want to bring awareness to the situation just a couple of things one in um four women experience some form of IPV, um, intimate partner violence. Um, one in seven women have been severely injured by um, IPV violence. So it is very common, um, very normal. It, I mean, not normal, but it is a problem. Mm -hmm. It is a problem. Yeah. Wow. And I would just say that we have, we definitely have come a long way uh, in the fight against intimate partner violence. Um, years ago, it was considered a family issue. Like mm -hmm. nobody, nobody wanted to touch it. The authorities didn't want to get involved. Uh, law enforcement, prosecution, courts didn't want to get involved. They felt like it was supposed to be worked out between whoever, um, that man and that woman in that particular um, incident. Now we have laws that are constantly being changed, constantly being updated to protect mm. people who are in intimate partner violence relationships, to protect members of the LGBTQ community. The language in the laws are changing. The language in the laws um, now include everyone, regardless of um, sexual orientation. So we are continuing to fight the fight, but we still have a long way to go. Mm. Wow. Yeah, still have a long way to go. And then another thing too is um, um, the churches. A lot of the churches, um, when I was growing up, I didn't, I didn't hear about um, 
intimate partner violence in, in the churches. Today, it's still um, several churches who won't touch the issue, but I can say I have gone and talked to several churches now about intimate partner violence. So you still have people um, of the cloth and faith-based organizations who are actually shedding light on intimate partner violence because back in the day, um, even your own pastor or um, whoever was over your congregation, they did not want to talk about intimate partner violence, even though they may have had members in their congregation who were in intimate partner violence situations. They couldn't go to um, their pastor and say, I'm in this intimate partner violence situation. I need help. A lot of the pastors didn't really know what to do. And some of them still don't really know what to do. So that was my next question. Um, if somebody does go to their pastor, um, what do you typically see happening? If somebody goes to their pastor or somebody in the church, what kind of results do you see? Usually, usually when they go to their pastor, their pastor in the church, um, what I have seen, and I haven't um, talked to all pastors, only maybe a couple, one or two, they contact the authorities. Um, they contact either law enforcement or they may contact um, um, an agency that deals specifically with intimate partner violence and okay. they'll refer their particular, their parishioner or their congregant to that particular service or resource. But I'm thinking years ago that didn't happen. For one, I don't think pastors are trained, are trained in how to handle um, someone who's in an intimate partner violence relationship. But a lot, a lot of pastors have um, been reaching out, trying to get more aware of services and resources, trying to do more oh, really? prevention, prevention and awareness. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So during the month of October, we get um, multiple requests to go out and talk to people in the community um, about intimate partner violence and what it is, what it looks like, what it isn't. Um, it starts like you said sometimes uh tina it starts in the younger years so we got to catch the younger the younger adults too the teenagers who are in middle school or high school and think that they're in love and and dating um so we got to catch them it too. starts young right it starts young. Absolutely. Absolutely. so my question is this why should people care why should they care? Because um, some people may feel like, okay, if that's what they want to do and that's what they, you know, that's how they want to live their life. That's what they want to let happen. Some people feel like that. So why should more people care about this subject? Okay, so domestic violence slash intimate partner violence is a crime. It is not any longer a family matter. So to me, that's why people should care because one, it is a crime. Two, because no one deserves to be abused by anyone. Um, spouse, um, a child in common, a boyfriend, girlfriend, no one deserves to be beat by anyone. So I believe that that's why people should care first and foremost, because one, it's a crime, and two, no one deserves, no one deserves the abuse. What do you say, Tiffany? I mean, it could be anybody. I'm just, it could be anybody. And I don't know if you're asking a question in the aspect of caring as a person continues to go back into a domestic situation, or you're just saying the broader of why I care about domestic violence. Because it's two, you know, it's two different things. But if you have, as we said, love and you care about people and being kind to people, why wouldn't you care? You know, no matter if this young lady decides, I want to go back four or five times. She doesn't need to be judged because we don't know the deeper issues, just as Kyla stated, this, or the reason that's making her go back. So we can't judge. Judging turns a lot of people away. You know, just as Kyla was speaking of the church, you know, you go into church and you may have had a baby out of wedlock and people look at you all crazy. And then it turns you away. Like, I don't want to go back there. It's the same with domestic violence. You come into a place and you're experiencing this. A lot of them are embarrassed. A lot of them, and we can't judge them to turn them away to make them feel like, oh, well, we shouldn't have came and tried to get help or, you know, I shouldn't have did this because they're going to feel judged and they're going to not go forward with trying to receive that help. Right, right. And I just think to myself, you know, I care because these type of situations could be happening to your closest friends, your, your family, 
you got to think about, you know, your son, your daughter. That's why, you know, I care because I have a young son right now and I try to school him, you know, on if something doesn't look right or if you're being too aggressive about a situation, you know, so I just think we sh we all should care because it can happen to anybody or anybody we love. Absolutely. You know? And it doesn't have to be in the forefront, you know, like you said, it can be your loved one can be experiencing this and embarrassed about it and it's hiding it, you know, so if you make it aware, you know, you have to make them comfortable where you can feel like they can come talk to you. I relate in having a young son and teaching him and telling him signs, social media plays a big part with um, IPV nowadays, social media is huge. Um, with domestic violence and IPV these days. So it's just as you said, because it could be anybody, your friend, your family, your neighbor, anybody. So. All right. Good info. So are there any closing, you know, anything you want to um, share with us in closing or any advice or anything, any resources you want to mention? I just want to say, for those who may be experiencing an intimate partner violence or anyone who knows someone who may be in an intimate partner violence relationship, because uh, I think that we all know somebody who either is in one or has been in one, um, there are services and resources available to you. Don't ever feel like um, you are not alone. And even though you may not want um, the person to uh, be prosecuted criminally, you may uh, still want to take advantage of the services and resources that are available to you because let's be real um, Intimate partner violence is about in most cases uh, Love the the person who's being abused there. They they love that abuser and they don't want to see anything bad happen to the abuser They just want the abuse to actually stop so it's hard for them to leave that particular that particular relationship so just know that you're not alone there are services and resources out here available to you. Um, there is a domestic violence hotline that you can call that will connect you to whatever um, services and resources are in your local area that you tell them um, um, where, you, where you are and they can get you to um, a wide range of services and resources. So just don't ever feel like you're alone, even if you don't want to um, move forward with some type of criminal prosecution. And let me just put this pin in, in here too. Just because you don't want to move forward with a criminal prosecution does not mean that a criminal prosec prosecution won't occur because it's not up to the victim in an intimate partner violence relationship to charge someone with the crime. That's up to a prosecutor's, a prosecutor's office. Is the victim a, a key or essential witness um, to it? Yes. Um, will their testimony eventually be needed? Yes, at some point. So that's why it's important that you be cooperative with a criminal investigation, but it's totally not up to you on whether or not someone is going to get charged with a crime. But even if you don't want to um, cooperate with a criminal prosecution, a lot of um, people who are in intimate partner violence relationships will still take advantage of the services and resources that um, an advocate group or a social worker can provide for them. Now, but real quick, how could that be good for someone who has been in a situation if the uh, prosecution takes over and charges the person? How can that benefit? Because I have heard of that before. I've heard a lot of conversations on that before. So in the long run, how could that really benefit the victim? Because you know, I, I just know that, you know, sometimes people, you know, feel like, oh, this is the worst thing ever. But sometimes when things look like it's a bad thing, it's actually a benefit. So could you mm -hmm. I think that I think that it's going to benefit. It's going to benefit the victim one because you're holding you're holding someone um, responsible and accountable for uh, his action. They have to answer to the crime that they committed um, by going through the court the court process. So not only does it help in that way, but it also helps the, the, the victim. Yes, the victim is going to get those services and resources, whether or not there is a criminal prosecution or not. 
but it can help um, strengthen the victim. It can help build up self-esteem. There are mm -hmm. advocates at each step of the process for, for the victim. We have court advocates specifically for victims of intimate partner, intimate partner violence. We have um, personal protection order advocates for uh, victims who are seeking personal protection, personal protection orders. So I think that it helps the victim in more ways than one. And again, it sends a signal or it should send a signal to the abuser, like, you're not going to keep doing this to me. Absolutely. You, you got to be held accountable and responsible at some point. Mm -hmm. And she may have been afraid to make the decision. She may have wanted to, you know, move forward with prosecution, but she was afraid and scared. So if prosecution still was able to push it through, they're advocating on her behalf. And she's probably like, oh, that's a relief for me. I didn't have, you know, that's something she could say, well, I didn't do it. They did it, you know, and that may give her some motivation to move on out the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, because sounds like it could be the gateway to freedom that absolutely. maybe person didn't have the strength to or the information to, <clears throat> to do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's awesome. You got any uh, words of encouragement or words of wisdom you want to leave us with, Tiffany? <clears throat> um, just, just know that there is help out there for you. Don't be embarrassed. Um, you can always utilize uh, the national websites. There are agencies there. Um, I encourage you, if you are in a domestic situation, to do the do the uh, buddy system. You know, let somebody know what's going on. Um, you know, share your thoughts with someone who you can trust, where you don't have to worry about being judged. And know that, you know, it's not the end of the world. It may be a chapter, but it's not the end of your story. So therefore, you know, if you want help, seek help. Don't be embarrassed about it. Don't feel like there's no help about it. And like I said, never be ashamed of anything that you have been through or are going through. Right. Yeah, because we can, um, we all, you know, there, what, what do they say? There's no testimony without a test or, you know, you don't have a story or you can't help somebody right. else if you haven't been through something. Absolutely. So I'm going to share my story later. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, okay, okay. you know, I just want to add to that. Um, we need to just trust the process. Sometimes it doesn't seem like the process is actually working, but there is a process and we need to just trust the process um, on all sides of the spectrum. So if you're in that relationship and you're trying to get out, just step forward and ask and trust the process. I love that. Absolutely. Great advice. I guess that's it. That's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you, thank you for this opportunity for too. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your time. And hopefully we'll have this message out to help so many people. And that's all we can do. I guess it's a great first step. Absolutely. Let me give you the, um, the phone number for the uh, Domestic Violence National Hotline. It's 1-800-799-SAFE. Um, S-A-F-E. All right. I think that's it. Is that, did I say that one right, Tiff? Yep, that's yep, yep. 799 safe. 1 800 799 S A F E. That's the National Domestic Violence Hotline that can yep. connect you um, to any services and resources in your local areas. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. You're yes, welcome. Right. Well, Have thank a good you. one. I'm sorry, what'd you say, Tim? Oh, I said, no, you're welcome. I, I thoroughly oh. enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. So I will let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. I'm sure that you will be back because I plan to grow and to um, really start some good programs and I'll definitely need your wisdom. Absolutely. No problem. Have a good right. one, ladies. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. That's real estate news from the D. That's Detroit and Detroit suburbs. And um, I will catch you on the next one and we will post all of the uh, telephone numbers and resources below this video. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.